Hello and welcome. It is actually me, but I've lost my voice, so I'm getting very close to the microphone. Um, and I've got a chest infection, which is not great. Um, but hopefully uh, this video will make sense, which is about melody writing. And the reason I'm doing it is because recently there was a really interesting discussion on VI control um, about melody writing, where um, a practitioner posted his melody and asked us to basically roast it for him. Uh, and I hope that we haven't and hope that we've kind of got back with some helpful suggestions. But it did make me think about melody writing and the ways in which it's taught in a number of different places and certainly in some of the literature as well. Um, so this is what he wrote. Let's ignore the harmony completely, but this is the tune. Um, now, this is supposed to be, I think, a self-contained melody. Um, and it is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine bars long. Um, I think that's supposed to be a dotted minimum at the end to make up the four beats and a bar. Uh, so it's an irregular melody for a start. Um, now, if I was teaching melody writing, um, I would definitely ask students to just do a four bar phrase, then an eight bar phrase, then a 16 bar phrase, 32 bar phrase, etc. Um, and um, there are a number of sort of overriding compositional principles to this. Um, so John Painter, in his book Sound and Structure, says the following. He says, what makes a good tune good? Like any other musical form, if it is to be successful, a self-contained tune with or without an accompaniment, and whether or not it has associated words, must fulfil the expectations raised by its main musical idea. This may be nothing more complicated than a rising or falling interval at the start or a distinctive melodic or rhythmic figure in the opening phrase. Nevertheless, it is this which dictates how the tune shall go on, how it shall sustain itself throughout its course and what its overall duration shall be. Assessing the correct treatment for the main motif is a vital part of the art of composing a tune. And I don't disagree with anything that he says on that at all. Especially because in his book, Fundamentals of Musical Compositional, um, by Arnold Schoenberg, musical composition, sorry, by Schoenberg, he says the following. Um, a complete musical idea or theme is customarily articulated as a period or a sentence. These structures usually appear in classical music as parts of larger forms but occasionally are independent. There are many different types which are similar in two respects. They centre around a tonic and they have a definite ending. In the simplest cases, these structures consist of an even number of measures, usually eight or a multiple of eight. The distinction between the sentence and the period lies in the treatment of the second phrase and the continuation after it. The construction of the beginning determines the construction of the continuation. In its opening segment, a theme must clearly present, in addition to tonality, tempo and metre, its basic motive. The continuation must meet the requirements of comprehensibility. An immediate repetition is the simplest solution and is characteristic of the sentence structure. If the beginning is a two-measure phrase, the continuation in measures three and four may be either an unvaried or transposed repetition. Slight changes in the melody or harmony may be weighed with, without obscuring the repetition. So there are many different forms of how this takes, but the, the main takeaway is that the main motif is paramount because without its correct assessment and treatment, we can't do anything at all. Um, I then read for another book by uh, Paul Sturman, um, called Harmony, Melody and Composition. He just talks about the tonic triad. And he says, a key um, is a group or family of notes closely related to each other. Fine. The tonic is always uh, in a central role. A melody will often start on the tonic, not always, but often, then use other notes, but nearly always return to the tonic in the end. Frere Jacques is a good example.
where the tonic A is repeated um, in bars one and two. In fact, the bar two is the same as bar one. And also right at the end, in th the third phrase, and then in the last phrase. So it's centered around the tonic. And that's really important as well. Um, so um, if we have a look at this melody, there is some semblance of logic to it in the case that we've got a dotted rhythm here. But it doesn't repeat the interval and it doesn't repeat the first bar. So in terms of the purely simplistic variation, um, it, it doesn't really um, do what it should do logically. The other slight issue with it is that because it's in C major, we have real issues of where the notes are. So C has to begin there and it goes quite high. So it's quite a high melody um, and that poses <clears throat> significant problems. And so when I would be teaching melody, I would suggest perhaps transposing it to G, which is what I did. Um, so instead of having a repeated note, which is OK, um, my first suggestion was to actually just change this one note if that was to try and retain the same idea, otherwise it's my work and not the other person's work, to just change that note here. <coughs> so by the logic of this, um, we can now use that as an ex and, and, and exploit it as a motif. Uh, and we can also use the upbeat as well, which is a scalic move. So now we're widening in the interval, and we notice these notes here. And we could even notice this as well. So in its outline, that's what we're getting. But I reiterate the uh, note G uh, because um, I was imagining no accompaniment to this at the point, at that point. So we got a nice widening of the interval and it's now using the energy generated in the first bar into the second bar. So we could abandon the G here in bar four, we could write and also tie the D as well. That would be the other suggestion. So we could also do that, but then it makes a little bit of a mockery of not using the, the interval widening technique here. So I went for the interval widening as well. And then quite a nice bold statement right at the end, which sort of almost uses this fifth again and again and again. Um, in different ways. So we have an inversion and then another inversion. If you think about um, how um, the, the main theme for Star Wars, tonic, tonic, like that. So it repeats the tonic quite a bit um, and also uses quite wide leaps as well. Um, so, um, yeah, there, there are also sorts of other things that we could probably do with it as well. That was just a sort of one specific go. And then I think there were some uh, some strange harmonies that were going on um, at that point as well. So uh, I'm not going to bother with that um, at that particular point. Um, but I think the, the main thrust of it was the fact that it needs to have some sort of internal logic. So, um, you know, unfolding of forms of which notes and intervals are the agents spinning out more and more subtle nuances of pitch relationships, establishing an identity of melodic idea by giving it specific characteristics and concentrating on what might become memorable. Um, so, you know, so lots of leaping, you know, which is the melody from the Indiana Jones movies. So a balance of what audiences feel is recognizable which means repetition, and what might surprise and delight through unexpected shifts. Too much repetition can become boring, but diversity can become bewildering because we lose its thread. 
And that's what happens here, is that there's too much diversity and not enough repetition. Uh, and also the problem is that it keeps going up, um, which means that the second half of it doesn't bear any relation to the first half at all, really. Um, we've got a little bit of um, uh, sort of dotted rhythms here, but they don't really, it's not exploiting this enough um, because the there's too much diversity within it. So we've got to be careful about different sorts of shapes, and of which there are many. Um, you know, we can think of things like uh, Rachmaninoff, Third Piano Concerto. Like that. Um, so sort of centred around the same note, basically. Um, First piano, uh, second piano concerto, rather, Rachmaninoff. Um, all sorts of different things. Or we could have something arpeggiaic. That's sort of Beethoven, op two, number one. So we also need to give it some shape and direction, rhythmic interest. We might have a wide or specific interval, but we might not. What are the progressive and recessive features? Progressive is wide and leaps, it's faster and higher. Might be forte, might have short note values, might have sound, it might be syncopated, and it might be staccato. Recessive features are the opposite, narrow, stepwise movement, slower, lower. It might be softer, piano, longer note values, rests, no syncopation regularity, and it might be legato. We might also have controls that maintain musical interest. For example, ostinato accompaniments can be unifying but they can also be quite recessive because it restricts variety and therefore the melodic interest is crucial to maintain interest because the ostinato is not enough to maintain it. So we need to establish the idea, the motif, the key, the figuration and then when it feels right to do so, we can change things. So that means being in control of progressive and recessive devices. Melodic change, transposition, inversion, imitation, Retrograde, decoration, embellishments, internal repetition, omission of some part of the motif, alteration of the intervals, which can or may not be systematic, augmentation, diminution, rhythmic displacement, keeping one element so that it leads to a new motif out of the chrysalis of the first, for example, Ligeti's first string quartet. Um, phrase lengths, that might vary. Rhythmic interest, dovetailing and orchestral lighting where... Uh, writing where one end of one line is the beginning of another one and changing the notes by introducing chromatic adjustments. So when we go back to um, Schoenberg's book, he gives some really interesting examples of um, pieces, <coughs> pardon me, um, which uh, are all sorts of different sort of melodies and he talks about the antecedent and consequent um, of... Uh, the contour of the melody um, and there are so many different examples of it that it's it's you know uh, we can't really go into all of them um, so this one is an, an interesting example here Really interesting. So it's quite varied. So what's interesting is that here he says that it's a variation of kind of is slight variation and now it needs balance. And then a really recessive device, chromatic adjustment, and then a full cadence right at the end. Um, so it's a really interesting sort of um, study, the Schoenberg book.
because he does really talk about it quite in extensive detail. But of course, all melody um, has as many different designs as it is possible to think of. Um, so this one. That sort of idea. Um, or this one, for example. So this, um, that one, sort of a string quartet uh, by Mozart, um, it uses the same um, notes, I suppose, as bar one in bar four. And that's something that we can sort of work on as well. So here we could do that. Let's imagine that we didn't write that. And we start off with just this exercise here. So now I'm getting into some written work. So... So I might go up in sequence and just do that. I could slow the whole thing down and do the same thing. Like that, and actually repeat the same idea as well and just repeat it. So let's stick with this for the time being. I could even also just make it into a scale. So that would make this one logical to also do the scale. I could also introduce more interval. Like that as well. <coughs> but I'm also not using this at the moment. So I'm going to go up to the D. So now I'm going to go down. And I also want a feeling of going to a dominant at this point as well. This is obviously a very sort of basic form of melody writing. I'm not trying to be Brahms or Beethoven at this point. Just very, very basic. And then probably a dominant. Just using primary triads. So now that I'm on uh, bar four, or bar five rather, let's just do another bar number change here. So it's a bit confusing. There we go. So I'm going to repeat bar one. Now I'm going to change it. Maybe something like that. So that I've got a little high point and direction to where I'm going. I think that's better to have the arpeggio. Bit of contrast. So I... So it's a little sort of simple matter. Do I do that? Maybe. Um, this, this suggests more of a... more of a sort of plagal ending, which gives a more passive ending. Or we could have a sort of dominant. Like that. Um,
<coughs> all sorts of different harmony that is possible, but the main thing is that it starts and ends on the tonic, which is the first lesson um, in that melody writing book that we're told about. Interesting enough, in the uh, ABRSM, AB Guide to Music Theory by Eric Taylor, um, this sort of stuff uh, doesn't get talked about until a bit later on, um, which I always find sort of rather surprising. He does talk about motifs, but um, it, it doesn't really talk about the construction of the melody very clearly, because it talks about design. Um, but really, the main sort of um, design is, is sort of to do with whatever opening that you get. So, for example, that idea. So little sort of um, interruptions as well, with leaps as well. Um, like that. Um, so an uh, interesting sort of design that we get there. Uh, 4A also uses um, designs on the tonic as well. As a piece uh, in his songs. Like that, and it just keeps going down to F. Really weird. But basically, the main purpose of this was to just talk a little bit about melody. Um, I had a student, I can't remember um, who Sophie was now. They came up with this interesting melody. I think it's a really cleverly, cleverly worked out melody, um, which basically um, can go in a variety of different keys. So we're starting off in G minor. Um, Something like that might be a useful harmony, which is a sort of vague outline. And so when constructing this, um, there's obviously thought to how it's harmonised. It's a really nice way of using bar one in bar two, because it's a direct retrograde, really, um, or inversion of the bar one. And then it leaps up. get to the dominant as well, which is really nice. Then another leap, then a chromatic change. We could even do an interrupter cadence. Um, yeah. something like that. Um, so sometimes, you know, just being able to improvise um, chords underneath um, also might be a sort of interesting one as well. But that was a really interesting exercise and one which basically they, they followed all my advice, really. Didn't try and do anything too outrageous with um, what they were doing. Interestingly enough, there's um, in the Schoenberg idea, um, he also talks about sort of retrogrades and uh, changing motifs as well. Um, so for example, he uses this motif. And then of course you can transpose it, embellish it, rhythmical change, transposed, uh, and a mixture of both.
uh, and then he does a minuet with the same thing. Like that. Interesting. Developing variations of a motive based on a broken chord. So that's the one that he starts off with. So he just changes it to add a dot. Then adding a dot on the third beat. Adding dots on beats one and three. Then now, another change, rhythmic change. Like that. More rhythmic change. Addition of more notes. Like that. Changing the original order. So embellishing it as well. Uh, so all sorts of different things. Reductions, emissions and condensation. This is just from one idea, one motif and all the various ways in which it can be manipulated. And that's something that we'll talk about another time, which is what do you do with what you've got and how does it change? But I think this is actually quite a good idea. We don't need to change it. Um, I'm sure there's a 4A piece like that. I think it's a flute piece, isn't it? Um, anyway, so uh, sort of hopefully um, a, a slightly odd um, video for you today. I, I'm obviously not very well at the moment, so um, I haven't really been able to do very much um, otherwise. Um, but I just thought it was interesting to have a look at some aspects of melody writing. Um, this was an interesting one where um, it was sort of, you know, using the idea um, to affect um, some sort of other change. <coughs> I think it's been changed slightly, um, but we have sort of various problems. We've got consecutive fifths. Uh, for example, there, we've got a very wide leap. Um, as well, um, which is a bit strange. Um, we've also got um, all sorts of other things, which is an exposed octaves where we have a leap in the soprano, uh, sort of going to an open sound. Um, the third is fine. Uh, some people sort of say you can't double the third, absolute rubbish. Um, the bark doubles the third almost every single chorale, and in fact, even in the very first chorale in Riemann Schneider. He does this, like that. So he uses a double third all the time. Um, we've also got sort of other sort of consecutive octaves as well. So sort of preempting chord one before chord one is a bit strange. Um, so yes, um, it, it's, it's sometimes when you have your melody, you've got to think of the harmonic implications at the same time that you're doing it. Um, so hopefully you found that reasonably useful. Um, but uh, I shall be back, hopefully fit, fitter uh, than this week. Bye for now.